Thank you very much, Fran. Uh, thanks for inviting me, and uh, it's really good to be to be back in in New Zealand, uh, breathing the clean air and uh, enjoying uh, all the great things about this country. Uh, I've been just very briefly about myself. Um, that was a wonderful introduction. Thank you, uh, flattering um, <laughs> introduction. Uh, I've been in China 13 years since I graduated uh, from university. I uh, sort of worked my way up in the journalism world. Uh, so these days I uh, am the bureau chief for China for, for the Financial Times. We have about 20 people now in China, including our foreign correspondents and our domestic uh, uh, staff as well. And um, yeah, I, I intend to come back to New Zealand one day. Um, but for now, being a journalist, I think, probably the most exciting, most amazing place in the world right now has to, has to be China because of all the changes that are happening. And because I was saying to some people earlier, if you were to hold a conference like this five or even especially 10 years ago, uh, there would have been a few students and maybe a couple of journalists. Uh, most of the people in this room, or many of the people in this room probably wouldn't, wouldn't be here. But today, the amount of interest in China and the, the level of uh, focus on what's happening there is, is obviously greatly increased since, since I've been working on China. So today, um, I've been asked to talk about uh, what, does, uh, what does the new leadership in China, they've been in place for about a year, what are, what are they doing, what are they, uh, what is the investment environment for foreign businesses, operating environment for foreign businesses, how is it going to be affected by the new leaders, um, especially we're coming up into a very crucial meeting in November called the Third Plenum of the 18th Communist Party Congress. Uh, and this is really expected to set uh, the direction for the next decade, potentially, uh, in China, the Chinese economy and um, Chinese society at large. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Xi Jinping and about the new leadership and about where it's going. Um, I cover myself, I've covered everything in China over the years, but I'm most focused now on politics. Um, we've had an, a very, very eventful last couple of years in politics in China, which is unusual. Um, normally it all happens behind closed doors and you don't get to see it, but we've got a real glimpse over the last uh, couple of years. Um, I also cover the macro economy and international relations. So the first question, I guess, um, is this working? So um, this is the, uh, probably a lot of you are familiar with The Economist, uh, but maybe you don't know that the Financial Times group owns 50% of The Economist, so they're a subsidiary of, uh, of The Financial Times. So um, this was, I thought, a brilliant um, cover. They always do good covers, as many of you know. Um, this is Xi Jinping as the Qianlong Emperor, um, and he's, uh, this is obviously referring to Xi Jinping's vision. What does Xi Jinping want? He wants to... Uh, in a nutshell, he wants to stay in power. I think that's the overriding imperative for the Communist Party and for Xi Jinping. But uh, more than that, he wants to make China great again. The official slogan that he's been using since he took over about a year ago is the Chinese dream, which is defined as the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. There's a very strong school of thought in China that believes in, that in order to maintain peace and global harmony, China needs to revert to its old position as the center of the world, and uh, the international order needs to be reordered so that you have more of a tributary relationship model where, where other countries uh, recognize and view China as the center of the world and as the most important uh, country in the, in the world, um, maybe the US. Right now, the Chinese are talking about a new type of great power relationship in which there's one other great power besides China, and that's the US, but uh, not for much longer, maybe. Um, so I think uh, we in New Zealand and people around the world really need to understand how China views its place in the world and how it looks at uh, other countries. Has anyone in this room ever studied the opium wars? So a couple of you have, uh, not very many. Um, some of you may have heard about the hundred years of humiliation at the hands of foreigners and how China was carved up like a melon by the foreigners. Now, many of you will maybe have never seen this because at our schools and our universities, nobody, 
nobody studies the opium wars. I never studied the opium wars, and I did Chinese language and Asian politics and English literature. But uh, you know, the, it's really something that nobody nobody studies in this country. Nobody studies it in Britain, France, Japan, the US. Nobody. Really, it's very very niche topic. But I can tell you that every single uh, is that working? Yeah. every single Chinese primary school student can give you dates of the first opium war, the second opium war, that every kid who comes out of a, a primary school can tell you about all the humiliations that China suffered at the hands of, of the foreigners. Now, I argue that the way that China interacts with the world is formed very much by this education system. And if we don't understand it, we're going to make mistake after mistake. And we really, I mean, it's one of the key issues, I think, is people need to really understand how does China view the world and its interactions with the rest of the world. I'll give you a brilliant example. Uh, a couple of years ago, the British Prime Minister and a team of um, ministers, very high level, the biggest ever delegation, went to China, and it was November, and they, all of the ministers, of course, as you do in Britain, were wearing poppies for the Remembrance Day. And the ch this caused an enormous, enormous diplomatic spat. And the Chinese said to them, you cannot go on public on television in China wearing poppies in your lapels. And the British are like, what are you talking about? That's madness. We have to. It's Remembrance Day. And the Chinese are like, no, those are opium poppies. And you are reminding the Chinese people of the humiliation of the opium wars. And the British hadn't, they couldn't get, I mean, they, they had, nobody had thought about this. And all the protocol people that they have. And of course, then they leaked it to the press and it became a huge problem for, for both sides. Um, so I think, it's just a small example of how you really have to understand the way that a Chinese businessman sitting across the table is thinking about uh, interact interactions, particularly with the West. Um, so right now, uh, let me just let me just see where I am. Okay, so okay, I wanted to very briefly. Uh, go into um, something that happened, uh, uh, someone, something that someone mentioned earlier uh, this morning. I'd like to correct something uh, that um, someone said earlier, uh, one of the audience members. So uh, I don't want to single this person out or be really mean, but um, I do want to, uh, I think there was something was said that was not perfectly accurate. Um, the person was saying that they were in China when the Fonterra scandal uh, broke out and that the tone of the media coverage was balanced and fair and accurate. Um, I would say that that was relatively true. N not all of the English media uh, were fair and balanced and accurate. But in Chinese media, you have a Western, you have the English language media, which is directed to the outside world and is basically the propaganda uh, message that they want to send. Um, and you have a very different audience, obviously, 1.3 billion people, a very different group of people who read Chinese. And I would just point out that. In the uh, Chinese media, there was a very, very different um, set of messages being sent. Uh, we have something in the Financial Times group called Danwei, um, and they uh, monitor Chinese media and internet opinion. And these are the uh, front pages of all of the of a, of a selection of Chinese uh, newspapers on the day after the uh, Fonterra scandal broke. Um, the way that Danwei describes it, uh, the imagery is very much of a scare campaign with dozens of papers using evocative images of microscopic bacteria. Uh, even in one of them, there was even the Grim Reaper, Reaper was hanging behind uh, all these recalled products. Uh, some of the newspapers uh, suggested that the recall was going to uh, damage the reputation of all foreign milk powder, uh, not just uh, New Zealand milk powder. The front page of the Guangzhou Daily, I quite like this one, said, could the worship of foreign milk powder be coming to an end? Uh, the Chengdu Evening News said, are you still prostrating yourself before foreign milk powder? And another one, the myth of foreign milk powder is collapsing. Uh, other media, after Fonterra uh, started its um, PR campaign, you had other me uh, Chinese media calling, it a, the, calling the PR response a dirty trick, a clever trick, a dirty trick. Uh, you had, uh, and actually I would say in English, on August 5th, Xinhua, which is the official mouthpiece of the government, came out and said that New Zealand's problems aren't mere details. They're starting to look systemic. 
This is quoting in English. One could argue the country is hostage to a blinkered devotion to laissez-faire market ideology. However, to blame the succession of trade fiascos solely on free market naivete would be charitable. Uh, the glibness is stalking other aspects of New Zealand's foreign trade with the country's 100% pure tourism campaign becoming a festering sore as experts claim that the country might not in fact be 100% pure. Anyway, my, I really don't want to belabor the point, but I would just say that, uh, that all countries, are, when they're dealing with China, have to understand that when you mess up in China, you are absolutely going to be ripped to pieces. You, you cannot expect any sort of charity. You cannot expect 40 years of good uh, trade relations and good political relations to be any kind of guarantee of, uh, of safety because generally the Chinese media, well, and definitely the Chinese media is very tightly controlled by the propaganda apparatus and it plays into, uh, someone mentioned about xenophobic reports in, in the New Zealand media towards Chinese investment in, in, uh, in New Zealand. And I would just say, I, I would urge some, um, everyone to go and look at some of the uh, messages that are sent through the, uh, through the Chinese media and I mean, blatant racism and xenophobia. And, and so you have to understand that people are told that foreigners want to come and they want to pillage and uh, do horrible things. So I, I would just point out that, uh, that you have, you're starting from a position of weakness when you're going into China because of this colonial baggage in history. Um, This is a meeting, I think, happened last week or maybe the week before. I've been traveling a lot, but I think this was last week. So this is uh, uh, Chinese um, media explaining the meeting between uh, New Zealand Prime Minister and, uh, and Xi Jinping, the president of China. Um, the way it's worded there, uh, it's almost like um, John Key is the minister of um, milk powder coming to uh, give his report to the, uh, to the president, uh, minister of Chinese milk powder giving his report the way that uh, he, he's, uh, it says here he is Tong Ba, which is you know, sending the, uh, the message to, it's almost the way it's uh, set up is, is like that. Now, um, I think what's happened in the last couple of years is, uh, is really, really important. The, that there's actually been a very fundamental shift in the, way that, uh, in the way that China views, particularly the West, but the, the rest of the world, which is something I was um, alluding to before with the great power relationships. Basically, since the uh, great uh, financial crisis of 2008, uh, and since what we've been seeing happening in the, in the Middle East and uh, in the Arab Spring, and also Washington's complete ineptitude and uh, seeming um, desire to destroy America's credit rating and various other things, uh, we've really seen a shift. Um, I have now senior officials that I meet with and have met with over the years who tell me that they used to, there was a, at least a large faction within the Chinese system who used to want to emulate the West and used to want to um, move to a more Western style economic and political model. And those people basically have completely changed their minds. Um, you, and that is even more uh, apparent under Xi Jinping, who's been in power about a year. Um, this is what he said when he first was anointed as the heir apparent. Uh, he said, um, there are some foreigners with full bellies, that's a charitable way of putting it, but uh, there are some fo foreigners with full bellies with, and not much to do who, uh, who uh, like to point out and point at us and point at our faults, basically. One, number one, China does not export revolution. It doesn't export hunger and, uh, and chaos and strife. Um, we don't come around messing with you, so what else is there to say? This was his very first um, s statement on the public stage uh, in Mexico in, I think, 2009. And uh, people have taken this as a, as a quite worrying sign for his um, attitudes and the general attitudes of the new government towards the rest of the world. Uh, This year, uh, so I'm going to get on to um, very specifically into the foreign investment environment. Uh, this year has been a very difficult one uh, for foreign businesses, uh, not just Fonterra, um, but across the board, I would say. Uh, the, earlier this year, the Chinese government and police 
opened an investigation into GSK, the big pharmaceutical company, uh, for bribery. It, it looks like um, GSK has admitted uh, many of the charges that, um, that have been brought against it. Um, but other companies have also, been, uh, have also been affected, particularly in the pharmaceutical space. So the Chinese government has uh, opened a number of investigations. There's corruption investigations. There's also price manipulation investigations. There's also anti-monopoly investigations. The, uh, global pharmaceutical industry is um, as, uh, sort of under attack in some other countries as well, but in China, really, they're, they're kind of the, the front line at the moment. It's, it's been a really, really difficult year. I met with the head of security for Sanofi the other day, and he was just, he looked very haggard, very tired, and uh, he was explaining how um, they'd just been raided um, uh, on a number of occasions, and all of their computers been taken away, really. Uh, and that hasn't even properly hit the headlines yet. Uh, GSK has already. Um, another couple of examples. This is uh, this beyond the Fonterra. It, it's very interesting. The Fonterra uh, botulism scandal. It actually it happened exactly around the time, maybe a month or so after, the Chinese government had already um, launched uh, price investigations, uh, anti-monopoly pricing investigations into uh, milk powder in China, and so it was already. Um, an issue where the Chinese were, were really uh, working to, to crack down. And this was, I have to say, probably one of the greatest gifts that Fonterra could have given to the Chinese government was uh, a botulism scandal uh, right around the same time. Now, I would just say, as people have referred to the botulism as, as the scare, the, um, you know, it, it was something that, it was a scare, but it wasn't true. I can tell you, I would say, if you were do it, to do a poll, this is very unscientific, but I've done straw polls myself, and I've watched the Chinese media very closely. If you were to do a, a, a poll in China today and say, what do you, what do you know about Fonterra? 95% of people, I would say, would, would tell you they know about the botulism, botulism scandal. If you were to ask them, was it a false alarm or not, they would almost all say, oh, no, of course, it was, it was true. This is partly because of the way the media works. I, I know how the media works quite well. Um, we report the scandal. We never report the fact that it was a false alarm. It's not a sexy headline to say, that thing we told you about that happened a month or two months or three months ago, it, it wasn't really what we said it was. Nobody reports like that. I can tell you, I could show you the, the stories, uh, the, the false alarm stories from the Wall Street Journal, from the, New I don't think the Financial Times even did one, I am sorry to say. Um, I wasn't covering it, so I would have done it as my patriotic duty, but, uh, um, but I didn't see, I saw one very small thing on Xinhua saying that Chinese, uh, the New Zealand, and it was somewhat um, questioning and suspicious, the, the tone of the article, it said the New Zealand government says it was all a false alarm. They didn't go the next step and say, well, we shouldn't believe them because uh, look at their track record. But um, that, uh, yeah, definitely this has been a disaster. I can, I can pretty much say that without any qualifications that this scandal this year has been really, really bad. And, uh, the fact that it was a false alarm, I think, in some ways, makes it makes it even worse. Um, the beyond uh, beyond the uh, milk scandal, we also have uh, earlier in the year. Around every year in China, you have um, Consumer Day, and uh, around Consumer Day, you have um, these. Uh, naming and shaming of foreign companies. And I can tell you this is a huge business now for PR companies um, because every major multinational in, who, op who operates in China, they now get together on the night of the annual Consumer Day show, which is pub uh, played on CCTV uh, to the whole nation. Um, and all of these companies get together and they have crisis management dinners uh, and they get prepared. And when the show comes on, you're, you're waiting to see which company is named. If it's your company, bang, you step into immediate on your social media, on TV, on you know, everything. You have your crisis management all ready to go. This year it was the turn for Apple and uh, Volks Volkswagen. Volkswagen got out of it quite quickly. I, they, they were prepared. Apple, um, anyone in the room who's a journalist who's ever had to deal with Apple knows why they were hammered for at least a month afterwards because they just don't talk to the press. They don't basically have a media strategy. They think uh, you know their great products are enough. But, uh, not in China, um, although that's the first lady of China with her iPhone, I would point out. Um, Apple got it in the neck for about a month and a half. It issued three apologies, but the first two were not seen as sufficiently uh, uh, groveling enough. And um, 
So Apple just it got hammered and hammered. And if some of you have watched China closely for a couple of years, you'll remember what they were very, very worried about is what happened to Google a couple of years ago, where Google was a, uh, the attack on Google began. Uh, Google had something like, in the search market, it's something like 30, 35% market share. Today, it's less than 2%. And the reason is uh, it, it had to pull out, basically, um, after just a hammered, it got just over and over. First of all, it was attacked on pornography. Then it was attacked on one of these CCTV shows. Uh, finally, the, the censorship um, got worse and worse till the point where they decided to cut their losses and make a virtue of it, and they publicly said they were no longer going to censor their, their search results, which basically automatically cut them out. Now, if you come to China, as, as I'm sure many of you do, you need a VPN if you want to check your Gmail in China. So you can't even check, uh, and Google search results often don't work without a VPN, and it, it, Google is there in the country, but it's, it basically doesn't function really anymore. So um, Apple was very worried about that. It, it seems to have gotten off relatively lightly so far. Um, now, I, I want to answer the, you, you may be asking why this year has it been uh, such a tough year for foreign businesses? Um, I think it's a really important question. Um, I would say that the foreign businesses who have been attacked in each of these uh, cases um, are not really, it's not because China wants to attack foreign businesses because of the colonial legacy and whatever. They're much more sophisticated than that. Uh, that informs a lot of the interaction, but it's not, I mean, it's not the main reason. What, what's happening here is that Xi Jinping has taken over at a time of uh, unprecedented challenges, I would say, for, for the Chinese system. Uh, Chinese growth last year was the slowest uh, is in 13 years, the slowest rate of growth for the whole year last year since 1999. And if the growth uh, slows to 7.5% this year, which is actually the official target, it's the, uh, what, what a lot of people think it might come in at this year, um, that will be the slowest since 1990, if it, if it grows 7.5%. Uh, that's the slowest since 1990, when China was actually under sanctions, uh, international sanctions following the Tiananmen massacre um, in 1989. So, Growth is slowing. The uh, Chinese model is looking like it's running out of steam. Um, the Communist Party has come in, in a t at a time when corruption, official corruption, has uh, reached uh, totally endemic proportions. It's always been there, but it's uh, generally accepted that it's much worse now than it was, say, 10 years ago. Um, it's always really easy to score political points by attacking foreigners, partly because of the uh, educational system I mentioned before and the, the colonial legacy. Um, but it's also important for the new leadership to shore up its support amongst Chinese businesses, amongst the Chinese population. Uh, it's very important for the Chinese government to actually deliver uh, improvements in people's lives. So what's, what are the things when you ask Chinese people, what do they care about the most? Number one is food safety and pollution. Um, so these are huge opportunities, by the way, for, for our biz, you know, New Zealand businesses. But what's an easy way for the Chinese government to get people uh, you know, a bit happier and to shore up legitimacy in the Chinese system? It's to reduce the, the price of milk powder. Um, it's to uh, reduce the price of cars, which are much more expensive still in China than they are elsewhere. Uh, it's to improve food safety. Those are the things that will, will score real points for the Communist Party at a time when they're dealing with really unpre unprecedented challenges. Uh, those challenges um, include uh, the, there's a little plug for my ebook, which you can buy at Amazon for 99 pence. Um, uh, so, um, this, is the, this is a guy called Boshi Lai. I won't go into the details, but. Uh, this is his purge last year and the, uh, the trials that we've just seen um, the last month or so, which I had to cover, um, were, uh, that, that was the biggest political scandal in China really since 1989, since the Tiananmen Square incident. Um, this is uh, just an enormous destabilizing force from within the party, these uh, high level political battles. Uh, there's a lot of suggestions as you'll read from the Financial Times last Saturday written by FT reporters, uh, no one named for safety reasons. Uh, but this guy on the, uh, you'll see the guy in all those photos, he's on the left and the top right hand one. 
His name is Zhou Yongkang. He was in charge of state security and the entire uh, security apparatus. And it seems like a purge is going, uh, well, definitely a purge is going on of all his people, but potentially of him as well. So Xi Jinping has come in. He has to consolidate power in a really arcane system of backroom politics um, described as the shark pool of shark pools by, um, by a British diplomat to me recently. The Communist Party really, at the moment, is going through these unprecedented, unprecedented internal turmoil. And so it really has to... Uh, Xi Jinping has to score points domestically. He has to uh, improve people's lives in, in a really uh, basic, fundamental way. And one way is by using the, there's a great Chinese saying, overused, I think, in Chinese media, uh, in Western media, but it's still great. It's called, uh, we say, Xia Ji Gei Ho Kan, which is to uh, kill the chicken to scare the monkey. And unfortunately, in, this, uh, in these cases that I've outlined, I think that... Uh, that these, Chinese, uh, these Western companies are serving the role of the chicken quite well uh, to the Chinese SOE monkeys. And uh, um, sorry, they would not like me saying that. Sorry, Mr. Mr. Liu, Liu Zhong, why you something? Sorry, um, I'm not calling anyone a monkey. But uh, my point is that these are great examples. Uh, a senior official said to me very recently that the Chinese uh, way of tackling corruption, the way of tackling these. Uh, sort of endemic problems is to take five of the hundred corrupt officials and to really deal with them very, very harshly, and it, it sort of brings everyone else into line, at least for a, at least for a certain period. Uh, I'm just going to run through very quickly some some slides from this is just from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. I thought it'd be helpful to go through uh, some of the issues that that uh, these are American companies, but they apply. I could have taken these slides from the EU Chamber of Commerce uh, survey as well this year. Um, both EU and US chambers put out these annual surveys. I would um, suggest they're useful places to start when you're, if you're thinking about um, the challenges you might face in China. They're huge, voluminous things, um, but they do really lay out uh, some, some of the key challenges and issues. So uh, this is a big one. Um, 26% of companies operating, American companies operating in China say that they've had uh, trade secrets or proprietary data breached or stolen. Um, that's many more than last year. Uh, um, this is a good one. <laughs> Affects my job very, uh, it's very important for, in my job. So 72% of companies say slow or unstable internet access impedes their ability to efficiently conduct business in China. Um, internet censorship, uh, to what degree does internet censorship of content impact your company's ability to do normal business? So the number of companies that say it is negatively impacting their business has doubled over the last year. Um, partly that's a result of uh, a increased censorship and a, a real crackdown on the internet, which is part of Xi Jinping's um, campaign to consolidate power, to stop, to stifle any uh, sources of, of dissent on, online. Is technology transfer, I'm sure uh, engineering companies and others, um, high tech companies from New Zealand will, will face this problem at some point. De facto technology transfer um, as a requirement for market access is a, something that businesses complain about all the time. 35% of businesses say that it's, uh, that they have pressure to, to hand over their, the crown jewels. And obviously, you know, you may get market access for a little while um, once you hand over all your technology, but um, obviously that's a losing proposition in the medium term even. Um, IPR infringement is a, is a huge issue and always has been in China, uh, but it seems, to be, um, it seems to be becoming a bigger issue. If you can see there, that was 22% um, of companies said it caused material damage to their China operations. Now it's 34%. Um, and 10% said it was, uh, last year said it was damaging their global operations. Now it's 14%. That's a big increase. Uh, enforcement of IPR, 48% of companies said it was ineffective last year. 58% now say it's ineffective. So you can see basically a general trend here of in many, many areas, foreign businesses feel 
that they're, they're having a tougher time in China um, over the last year in particular. Uh, interestingly, um, rising labor costs is a, is a big issue, so is the slowdown that I uh, briefly mentioned earlier and some of the other problems you can see there. I'm happy to share these slides or point you to, the, to where these slides are if this is of interest to anyone. You can come up to me afterwards, I can send you those links. Um, so this is quite interesting. Um, over the last um, 10 years, particularly after China joined the WTO, there was a huge improvement, especially in those first few years, in the operating environment for foreign businesses. All sorts of trade barriers and investment barriers were, were removed. Um, I think part of what we're seeing is actually that it's not so much that things are getting much worse, as you can see here, that's 2012 to, is uh, opposed to 2013, but it's that things aren't getting better as they were getting better before. So in 2012, people thought 43% of companies thought things were improving. This year it was only 28%. Last year, 36% said things were about the same. Now it's 53%. Um, so I think that's a big part of what's going on in the investment environment. It's, it's not that things are getting much, much worse. There aren't all sorts of new laws uh, and new regulations you can point to and say, my business is uh, being affected by that. But what, there is, what is happening is that things aren't getting better as, they, as fast as they were before. Um, uh, so that is obviously affecting how people see their future in China. If you see their a gradual trend of people who are still investing, but they're investing a much smaller proportion than they were, uh, or a smaller proportion than they were in, in the last few years. Um, and uh, another one, so this is... Okay. So, in this environment, basically, uh, I would describe what's happening in China right now as an increasingly difficult environment for foreign businesses. I would say that um, just as New Zealand is waking up to all the op opportunities that there are in China, just as China, uh, China's become the biggest export market for New Zealand, um, you have this trend of things getting, getting a bit harder for foreign businesses. Uh, I would say, in conclusion, I'd like to kind of end on a more optimistic note. New Zealand has a couple of big advantages. And one is that we're not seen uh, like any of these people. These are the uh, former colonial masters and you know, Cold War superpowers. Uh, New Zealand obviously has a huge advantage of not being one of these. And I think at all times, having a working knowledge of China's historical context and the way that China views itself in the world and views foreign intervention and, and dealings um, with China is a very important advantage. And you can go in and say, oh yeah, those terrible British, didn't they do horrible things in the Opium War? But New Zealand, you know, New Zealand suffered greatly at the hands of the British colonial over overlords as well, you know. <laughs> Don't wear opium poppies on Remembrance Day, you know. Um, there are a few things, I think, that uh, give us a huge advantage. Now, um, the other thing, from my perspective, a very personal uh, perspective, um, Sorry, one, I'd I've written down a nice little sentence I'd like to say. So uh, in everything that foreign businesses do in China, I think you have to recognize that you will be welcomed as long as you're viewed as contributing to China and China's development. You'll hear this in every speech you ever hear from a Chinese official. Um, and providing real benefits to China in a respectful and a sensitive way. Um, you also, I would suggest, don't want to go up against many of the, uh, the big Chinese state-owned enterprises or the big China Chinese companies um, because the Chinese government wants to create national champions. If you can show how you as a business are contributing to making that company a, uh, a national champion, maybe global champion, then you will succeed. If you show that you're a competitor, um, especially one from New Zealand who can kind of be swatted away by any state enterprise, then you will find yourself potentially in, in more trouble. Um, so then I will end on a very optimistic personal note. There is a huge, huge opportunity, and that is, uh, this is where I live, um, in Beijing, and this is the view that I have to look out at almost every day. Uh, I wear a mask when I'm outside, and uh, we have these air cleaners, these huge, enormous air cleaners. I actually 
It's quite funny in my hotel like uh, room last night. I couldn't properly sleep because it was too quiet. I didn't have one of these air cleaners like buzzing away in the corner. So um, I would just say that um, this, you know, what the things that China wants, the things that the Chinese people are demanding from their leaders and from their big companies are exactly the things that New Zealand has in massive abundance. The things that we all take for granted, clean air, clean food, or relatively clean food, uh, and just ingenuity, creativity, those are the things that China needs and those are the things that New Zealand should be able to provide. So thank you. It's, uh, thank you very much. Thank you.